in, inferior de sus pantallas. Pero les agradecemos mucho que estén con nosotros. Uh, so welcome everybody. Um, it's really great to have you here in our uh, latest conversation uh, on, brought to you by Symbiosis. Um, today we're going to be talking about how journalists uh, should cover or are covering um, the climate crisis, an incredibly important subject. How, and we want, really want to delve into how we construct narratives that convey urgency, but also can drive us towards action. Um, Symbiosis, I should parenthetically take a moment to say, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a journalism tradecraft developing project launched by Gato Pardo and the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University. Um, so we're really uh, fortunate to today to be joined by Susan Goldberg to discuss this important topic. Susan serves as the Vice Dean and Professor of Practice at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, as well as the Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratories College of Global Futures, um, both at Arizona State University. At ASU, one of Susan's key roles is to help journalists and experts tell stories about how we are addressing and shaping the climate crisis and our collective futures. Um, thank you, Susan, for joining us. Thank you for having me. So I, I wanted to start off, um, you know, you have been the editor in chief of National Geographic, uh, where you were also the editorial director for National Geographic Partners, where you led journalism across all of National Geographic's platforms, including digital journalism, magazines, the podcast, the maps that we all love, the newsletters, Instagram. You were the first woman to serve as the editor in chief of the magazine since its founding in 1888. Uh, before that, you had a, a storied career in journalism, including uh, coordinating government coverage for Bloomberg News in DC um, and serving as an editor at the Plain Dealer in Cleveland, San Jose Mercury News. You have deep, deep experience in, in, in journalism and um, you know, sat at the sort of pinnacle of an effort to cover science and technology for the public. Um, you know, at the National Geographic, which is known for telling compelling stories and, and getting us readers to understand the world we live in um, through compelling storytelling. And I, I was, I, you know, fascinated by the language you used in your final letter um, as editor at National Geographic. I just wanted to read from this, um, where you posed two questions that are very pertinent to our conversation today. Um, you wrote, how can honest reporting on existential threats keep readers engaged without leaving them feeling hopeless? And how can journalism on these complex topics ignite audiences' curiosity, foster deeper understanding, and excite people about solutions? Trying always to achieve that balance while creating visually rich, repertorially deep global journalism has been both as gratifying and as vexing as anything in my professional life. Um, so you wrote that um, not, you know, you didn't step down that long ago, but, you know, since you're now an, an academic and you're, you're in reflective mode and, and you can look back on your, on your career in journalism as you're now embarking um, on, on the next chapter of your career in terms of really um, being able to leverage the resources of a, of a university and mar marrying our storytelling with our science. Um, how do you, how would you answer the questions that you posed, um, you know, not that long ago in terms of, of where we are with having this type of informative journalism about our climate crisis um, that doesn't foster a sense of, of despair and, and helplessness? Well, um, thank you, Andreas. I, I appreciate uh, the questions and nobody's ever read one of my letters back to me. So there, there you go, <laughs> that's first. And uh, I appreciate being here because I do think this is such an this is such an important issue. And as I thought about leaving, you know, daily journalism, uh, this struck me that it struck me that this was one of the big issues I wanted to work on. Because as I said in that letter, trying to figure out how to balance telling the truth about what is in fact a climate crisis, and at the same time not have people run screaming from the room right, and walk away from the content. How, how do you do those two things together is really hard. Um, and I, I feel like 
where we are as a profession is not in a good place on this. Either the coverage is so negative and so awful. Um, you know, the New York Magazine, not to pick on anybody, but to pick on them. They had a they had a cover a couple of years ago that showed, you know, the the what's usually that blue marble of Earth, right? That famous like picture for uh, taken uh, by the astronauts uh, of Earth, except it was all brown and burning up. And the headline on their cover story was the dead earth. And while it was certainly eye catching, and I think a lot of people might have picked it up, I really don't think that kind of approach engages people in wanting to solve the problem. It certainly makes them feel despairing. It makes them wonder if they should have children. It makes, you know, I mean, people are, are talking uh, in very drastic ways around this topic. On the other hand, you can't just be Pollyanna about this. You can't say, oh, everything's gonna be fine and don't worry, and, um, and that's not accurate either. So it's really figuring out how to combine, what we used to talk about at National Geographic was combining the wonder and the worry, right? Balancing, balancing those two forces um, and spinning up a creative and engaging piece of content that made people wanna know more rather than put it down. And it's hard. It's really hard to do because if you fall too much into the wonder, you're not doing anybody any favors by not telling accurate stories. And if you fall too much into the worry, I think you lose a lot of audiences. So it's that balance. And that is what is so hard about it. So, so talk us through um, some of the ways in which you try to, to navigate that, that tension and, yeah, I mean, look, at National Geographic, we are known for visual storytelling. And so, the, you know, a lot of the ways we tried to navigate it was visually. So if you were doing a story, for example, about, you know, how, how the changes in climate were affecting wildlife, you, know, you, could, you could have any number of really beautiful pictures of animals migrating or this or that, but you're also gonna end up with pictures of dead animals and animals that are starving because the food isn't there, or the landscape is changing, their habitat is, is no longer supporting them. And it was <clears throat> really a sense of balancing that, literally balancing the pictures. Now, I, you know, I didn't count, like, you know, do we have, we have five sad pictures and five happy pictures. I don't think that's the, that's the way to perform journalism, but I always thought we needed to show people why they should care that things were changing. And so you do want to show a certain amount of the beauty of the earth to engage people in it. So they're going to care about what happens when things change. This is a, this is not a problem. This is this, this tension in how we tell these stories and anticipating and worrying about whether audiences, you know, if, if you're in, a magazine or newspaper readers, or if you're TV, a viewer, but, but worrying about whether they're going to find it too off-putting because it's too bleak. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, that's not a conundrum unique to this issue. And I try, but I do try, I wrestle with, so what is so distinctive about this issue? Because, you know, if, uh, you know, we've had previous in previous decades, horrific famines in parts of the world we've had, which actually might be connected to, to climate change, but, but that, that's been a story, you know, a story in and of itself that people have wrestled with, you know, how do you tell that story and, and not have the same kind of um, fatalistic response of, oh, the, these challenges are, are too, you know, big, or, you know, more recently, the, the horrific situation, you know, in Ukraine. I mean, we have plenty of, of, you know, calamities that occur because of people acting horrifically. In this case, you know, uh, a, a certain leader in, in Moscow, right? And and you, if you're at the New York Times or if you're at Reforma in Mexico City, you have this dilemma about whether you put on your front page the pictures of you know civilians um, that have been massacred in a Ukrainian town um, 
or is that going to be too too much bad news? Just too horrific for for your readers, right? Um, but as as journalists, we often feel like we need to, um, you know, not try to soften the impact of the, what you know, or take the edge off what might actually be terrible, and that there is this sort of function of journalism to sort of shock audiences into appreciating the the full horror here. So I'm. I go back and forth when when you when you bring these debates into the the climate story, I'm I'm somewhat sympathetic to the New York Magazine editors who felt like we've got to get people's attention somehow. Um, but then it it also does feel like a bit of a provocation. And if the message is you know we're we're done, it, we're, you know it's all it's all hopeless then. That's also doesn't leave you in a very satisfying place. So, but what is it about you know the climate? Um, and first of all, what, what do you call it? You know, do you talk? Do you talk about you know covering? Uh, cli- I know climate change seems to be out of favor in some outlets because maybe that just felt too too passive. And so you know now we often refer to it as climate crisis. Or what's the language that that you like to use? And then what feels like very distinctive about this, as opposed to this navigating, you know, wonder and and worry and, and and other stories. Well, let me let me go back to one of the points you made about the war in in Ukraine. <clears throat> Look, I think that there is a that ger- there is no there is no um, you can't pussyfoot around on something like that, right? You've got to show that situation exactly as it as it is. You've got to show. You know, Lindsay Adario's incredible picture of that family that was they were all killed. Right. You know, and and waiting for their ride to safety. Exactly. And there were pictures of dead children. And that is not a photo that any editor runs lightly. But I think that this is one of those stories where you absolutely need to show what is happening so that the world understands what's going on there. Uh, At the same time, that does not prevent you from talking about the actions of heroes who are helping that situation or from giving people information about how they too can, they could get involved or giving them lots of information about how the politics in their country is playing out or how the, how, you know, the politics across Europe are playing out and how that could really, you know, affect this war. So Look, I think I think our role is absolutely to shine the bright light on all the dark places and and then give people as much context as possible for evaluating the information. And that that is also true for climate. I'm not I'm not saying, oh, just do a bunch of happy climate stories at all. But I I do think that the climate story is a little different because it's it's felt up until very recently like both a slow motion crisis and something that's happening mostly very far away, right? right? Oh, the Arctic, it's melting. Well, you know what? I've been to the Arctic. It is melting and it's terrible. And I've been to Antarctica and it's melting too. And it's not a good thing. But most people don't get to go to those places and don't see it. And it has felt like a far away problem. I think just in the last few years, perhaps, that is changing and that all of us can see the impact of, okay, I'll say it, climate crisis, not climate change, but we can all see the impact of climate crisis where we live. We can see how the landscape has changed. We can see that the birds didn't migrate south this year because they didn't have to, right? You can can absolutely just see it. And that does make the story more real and more relevant. And I hope um, we'll get more people on board to doing something about it. Um, you asked about the language, you know, one of the great things about language is language is a living thing, right? So it changes in real time. Even when I wrote that letter and that letter appeared in the April issue, that, that is literally this month's issue. Oh, really? It's that recent. Okay. Yeah. So it was this month's <laughs> issue. So I wrote it right before I left. I left in February. Um, And I said climate change in there. Now, I did also call it an existential threat, but I did use the word climate change. And I I think perhaps that is not really the right language to use. I think climate crisis is a much more accurate 
reflection of what's going on. And I'm a journalist and I'm in the accuracy business. And so I think that the language changes because the situation changes or our understanding of the situation changes. And we ought to use the most up-to-date accurate language. Yeah, I, I really like that idea that, you know, we're not, you know, sometimes we have these stylistic debates about, you know, the, the language journalism uses and, and then pretend that that we need to set it in stone. You know, we, we print the AP guide and yeah. that's it. And so I, I really like that point that, that um, you know, language is, is living and, and can change and, and can adapt. And, and I, I do think that one of the, the things that feels different about this existential threat is, as you said, it, it feels like it's this very gradual, um, impersonal, Thing that underlies everything else that is always kind of overtaken by more immediate, you know, I, I was looking back at the coverage, you know, in, in late February, the latest IPCC, um, and I'm probably going to get the acronym wrong, but this is the UN, um, actually I have my, my cheat sheet here, it's the Intergov Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So, you know, they, it feels like they drop a report, you know, every six months or so, um, they had a report that came out, um, and their reports are really thorough and, and really good, but it, it came out February 28th, and of course that was four days after Putin's invasion of Ukraine, so it was overshadowed, and it just like that one, it feels like, you know, there's always going to be something overshadowing the climate story, and it might be, you know, the latest tweet from Elon Musk, <laughs> it, you know, in the Mexican context, it might be the latest, you know, Mañanera press conference from from you know, President López Obrador, there's always something, right? And these other stories have tend to have more human agency, right? There's this, you know, kind of like um, impersonal nature to the climate story, which which makes it, uh, you know, hard to kind of wrap your arms around and get excited about until you pick up, you know, uh, something like the National Geographic, which brings it to life by by telling these stories and going to these these habitats. But that New York Times. Um, story on February 28th about the latest IPCC report, you know, had a headline that I, I feel is sort of a, a classic of the genre. And I don't mean to knock it, but it, because it, I, I empathize with the, with the challenge, but the headline is climate change is harming the planet faster than we can adapt, UN warns. And, you know, I, I'm not sure what to do with, with a headline like that. Um, and, but it's, I'm sure it, it very accurately summarizes um, the report, right? Um, and it also has this, this uh, it's sort of an active voice as compared to, you know, Russian troops smash across the border or, you know, inflict this or that. You know, there's something about the story. And then you read about, you know, whether temperatures are going up 1.5 Celsius degrees or two over this, you know, century compared to the pre-industrial age. And these are hugely significant differences. But so hard, I think, for, for many of us who are not scientists to really kind of like understand the immediacy of, of them. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit related to this. You know, when you think about how our journalistic profession um, covers, you know, this existential threat, um, do you think that climate should be a distinct beat? Um, or is, is there a way in which we have kind of failed the story by the way that, you know, our newsrooms or news divisions are organized. And um, is there a way in which this should shape coverage of, of everything in, in, a, in, you know, in, in a different way? I know that's sometimes uh, easier said than done, but, you know, is, is climate a beat that, you know, you should have a couple of reporters worrying about and the rest of us should carry on covering the, the stock market or European politics, or how do you think about that? Well, you know, I, I, I mean, your question clearly has an opinion attached to it. And, um, um, and, and I don't disagree with your conclusion. Look, I do think it affects everything, right? The climate affects how companies are operating, climate affects consumer behavior, climate affects you know, where you're going to go as a tourist. Climate is going to affect what food you can buy and what food you can cook. And, you know, it's going to affect everything and it is affecting everything. So I think it's a both and though, because it's not a bad thing to have some number of people who are 
really well versed and understand the science and understand what it means if it you know if the temperature right. goes up 1.5 degrees celsius and what is the impact of that can be and and are going to really get it but it's also really important that every reporter whatever his or her uh, uh beat is or whatever his or her you know area of expertise is understands and looks for some of those some of those stories because they're everywhere and more and more what I'm seeing is, you know, the AP, the Washington Post, the New York Times, people are adding large numbers of reporters who are well-trained in understanding this story. And I do, because it is becoming an all-consuming story, right? So when the waters rise in Miami and, you know, every time there's a there's a high tide, more and more and more of the city ends up underwater. And this becomes just a regular part of how people are living. Um, it, you know, that affects, you know, city hall, right? So it, it is affecting absolutely everything. And one of the hard parts about all of this is to make sure we're always talking about what people care about most and what people care about most are other people. Mm -hmm. And too often, and, I, you know, look, every UN climate report that comes out is worse than the one before, right? And that's sort of why there's this dulling of and the almost normalization of, oh, there's another terrible report, right? About climate, oh, there's another one, right? Right. And, but so it really, the burden is on us. It is on us as journalistic professionals to figure out not to write it in that way but to really talk about the impact. Um, and that was one of, the, one of the reasons that it was rewarding working at National Geographic, going all around the world, showing this story, literally showing, not just telling. And I think that's very important in this story, showing people how this was affecting the world in different ways. But it's vexing because darn it's hard. And you know sometimes you wonder how, how do you write about these things to get people to care? Yeah. Um, you recently joined ASU, um, you know, and I should have made that clear at the outset that it, it's a very recent transition. And you have a, a, a fairly unique role in that you are the vice dean of our journal, Cronkite Journalism School. And you also have a position at our Global Futures College. And I, I think I, I kind of tripped over your, your full title in the intro. So sorry about that. But, but, but talk a little bit about, you know, what excited you or interest, intrigued you about being able to have that role of being both at a journalism school, but also working in, in our school that really houses a lot of our scientific experts that are studying this, this, this situation and also hopefully advancing solutions. And, you know, you're in this pretty unique spot of, of bridging those two worlds. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, that, that opportunity and challenge. Well, that is exactly what excited me. The, the idea of working kind of on both sides of the fence, right? Um, working with the journalists, but working with the scientists and seeing if we can get the, those two groups, which often don't really talk to each other or interact much to, you know, to work together. Should we, should we have, you know, a major that comes out of both of both of the schools, right? Comes out of the journalism school and comes out of the college of global futures. Should there be a major, what kind of executive education can we offer to people who are already professional journalists who are getting thrust into covering this climate story because it's getting to be a bigger and bigger story. So can we help them do a better job covering these stories? What about all the people who work for companies and need to talk about how green their companies are, right? And all the things that their companies are doing around ESG, environmental social governance. We can help, I think, through executive education, you know, people really understand that. I believe through through the stories that we write at Cronkite News and 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 working with professional journalists, we can model. We can try to model what's the best version of some of these kinds of stories. How should they be written, mm -hmm. right? And how do we get professionals who are really good at that to come work with our students to help us reach this next generation um, of of journalism 
professionals so they can do a better job telling what's really the biggest story of our times. Mm -hmm. We we have a, a related question from an audience member, Olaf Sarabia, and uh, you've touched on this a little bit, but then um, Olaf is also getting into something that, that I wanted to ask you about. So the question is, how would one cover the more systemic aspects of the climate crisis in an engaging way without being too abstract or impersonal? Conversely, how can one offer solutions to the crisis that people care about without falling into the pitfall of individualizing the issue? And I, and I think this is, a, this is an interesting theme that I wanted to get into to, to you as well. And, and Olaf, thanks, thanks you for, for, your, for being part of this conference. But Well, look, I mean, I think all of us know that ultimately if this problem is gonna get solved, it's gonna get solved at the mass governmental level, right? There is gonna be, there will be mandates by governments that how we, you know, how we get electricity is gonna change, right? How we yeah. fuel cars is gonna change. It, you know, it will have to be a large, large scale solution. But at the same time, I would have to say that I don't think there is anything wrong with individualizing it because people need to feel engaged and I don't think they can often feel like they can affect government, but they can be engaged as consumers and they can be engaged and, and try to get companies to change and they've got a lot of power there, but they, they also can do things themselves. You know, there's this parable, I think this is what a parable is, but there's a, there's a story and um, there's a giant forest fire and the, the fire is burning and all the animals have to flee. And a, and a bear and a hummingbird are among the animals that flee and they, they run out of the forest. And the bear says, oh my goodness, thank goodness we got out of there alive. But the hummingbird keeps going back to the fire, dropping one drop of water at a time on the fire out of its beak, just one little drop of water on this flame, on this you know huge forest fire. And the bear says, hummingbird, that is so stupid. You're not gonna be able to affect the forest fire. And the hummingbird says, maybe not, but I want to do my part. And I really think that I know it's kind of a stupid story, but I really no, I think that is what we want readers of our content around climate change to think. It's like, I am not going to save the world necessarily by, you know, using less single use plastic or whatever it is the thing that I'm going to do, but I want to do my part because if everybody wants to do their part, that's a lot of everybody's and that does add up to change. So I don't in fact think there's anything wrong with providing people practical information either about how candidates feel about, about various issues, right? How they vote, because that really matters or how individuals themselves can, can take part in solutions. I, I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah, I really like that parable or or, or story um, or whatever it is or whatever it is. And you know, I it 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 always surprises me. Maybe it shouldn't, but sometimes I'm surprised by how um, passionately people debate whether or not this story should be personalized. Um, and you know, I think so. Solutions journalism, you know, a term that gets thrown out, is is very much in in vogue and. And some people go, you know, as far as to say that, you know, don't give me uh, a story or journalism that doesn't have a call to action or, or you know, kind of give, gives me a, a takeaway of, of what I can do about this problem. Um, and again, if, if, if I'm watching CNN or, or reading, you know, my, my Phoenix paper or my New York Times about what's happening in the Ukraine, I'm not necessarily expecting a call to action about what to do about what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, maybe an easy thing that we all should be doing is trying to figure out how we can send some aid. But in terms of the underlying conflict, there, you know, there's an expectation that we should, as citizens of the world, try to be informed and that some problems are are beyond our individual action to, you know, other than, other than as citizens in a democracy. But at some point, there is this sense in which on climate, you know, um, my personal behavior is going to influence the outcome of this. 
And some people get very upset about that. And some people feel like, of course, and I like your, your story does kind of put it in, in a, in a way that, that I can understand. And I think that sometimes the pushback to this is the sense that it, it could breed this complacency that if I do my part, then the problem is solved. And of course, that's not, not necessarily the case as, as you, as you said at the, at the very outset, I am really impressed with, um, you know, kind of the younger generation's um, awareness and, and, you know, my, I have a, a son who's a teenager. I'm not impressed with that generation in all respects. <laughs> Sometimes I can be the crotchety old guy about, you know, certain things, but in terms of their, the, the awareness of, of the environment, environment, environmental impact of their lives, you know, it's just something that is far more ingrained um, in, in younger people today than, than it, certainly. It, and it is so true. And it's true for all of us. I mean, you know, we can all decide what kind of car we're going to drive. We can all decide whether we're going to wear, you know, junky clothes that you throw them away after three wearings, right? You, you know, you can yeah. all decide how much water you're going to use. You can, you can make choices. You know, yeah. I just, you know, you can decide if you're going to get a new stove, or you're going to get a gas stove, which probably you shouldn't, or you're going to get an induction uh, you know, stove, which you probably should, although a lot of people don't like them. So, I mean, there's all kinds yeah. of things that come down to choices and people can make choices and you should give them information so they can make informed choices. Yeah. I, I now feel terrible if I ever am tempted to use a straw and that's kind of a, a recent change in, in attitudes towards straws and, and behavior. And, um, you know, that's probably not going to make a material difference. Um, but collectively, um, I, I do think it makes a difference and, and we all, we all, um, can do our, our part. Um, and yet maybe as journalists not shy away from the parts of the story that are beyond our, our individual, um, efforts and, you know, related to this, um, we, we talk a lot about, at Arizona State University and in, in the college that you're in about um, our collective futures, um, right? And, and what, what, what do you think, how do you think we should understand that? Because this sort of, I think, relates to this, um, you know, we're navigating between the individual and, and the macro. And then also, I think, you know, we, we could introduce the subject of, of equity. And if you want to address that, there's a there's a sense in that. And I know this was a theme that, that was pretty important to a lot of New York National Geographic reporting that, you know, this is an existential threat to the planet, um, but we're not all similarly situated, both in terms of um, the responsibility that we bear for the industrial age um, emissions and also the wherewithal that individual uh, countries or parts of the world might have to contribute towards a solution. So um, how, do, how, how should we think about that as journalists? You know, it's a lot, we're seeing this play out in real time during the pandemic, right? And how different people and different groups of people were affected very differently by it and continue to be so. You know, and the and the poorest and most vulnerable among us, whether you're vulnerable because, um, you know, you're you're poor and isolated, or you're vulnerable because you have some underlying issues um, that that will hurt you. Uh, you know, those are the people who are going to be the most affected. And I think for those of us who are privileged enough to be able to work on stories about these things, we've got to make sure that, that readers see outside of themselves, see outside of their own situation, see outside of the you know, flood and the fancy part of Miami and understand that there are countries not all that far away where people are having to leave, leave those places entirely because they're going underwater. And so I, I do think one of our jobs as journalists, whether we're covering the pandemic or climate change or really anything, is to make sure people see that bigger picture and to give them the broadest sense of information about how events affect people not like them. Um, and it's, you know, it can be hard to make people care, but um, 
I, I really do believe that people, people are the most interested in other people and what happens to other people. And so that there is a natural inclination for that story, much more so than, you know, the, the pros around a UN climate report. Right. Um, I want to turn to questions from Aaron um, Stigil, Stigil, and apologize if I'm not getting the pronunciation on your last name correct, but um, Aaron is asking, um, do you think it is an issue that much of the mainstream media accepts ad money from the fossil fuel industry, especially when it comes to the media's overall integrity when reporting on the climate crisis? So interesting question. You know, I was talking, you know, we were talking a little bit about the impersonal nature of this crisis at times, um, but obviously there are um, players involved in, in, in different aspects of, of, you know, the our energy ecosystem. And, and certainly this is a very live topic in, in Mexico as well. Um, and, and media operates in, the, in that environment where different interests are participating and buying ads and have, might have, you know, regulatory interests. And um, do, do you feel that that remains an, an obstacle to journalism's tackling of, of this issue or, or how, how would you think about that? I don't think it's an obstacle. I mean, I, I think what's an obstacle is if uh, there are no media outlets because they've all gone out of business. I think that is the obstacle. Um, right. I think most good journalists understand that <clears throat> there are a variety of people and interests that support the journalism ultimately. And some of them are giant corporations, multinational corporations involved in industries that, you know, don't always do the right thing. And some of them are, you know, the people who, who subscribe to you, the regular everyday people who, who subscribe to your, to, to, you know, your, your media outlet. Um, but you know, as you said, Andreas, you know, I've been a, I, up until uh, February 14th, I was a practicing journalist for 42 years. And um, I don't really feel like I ever was influenced by who was taking out ads in my newspaper or in our, in our newsletter or who we partnered with on our Instagram account or, you know, any, any of that. The closest it ever actually got was back in the bad old days, right? Where I was working for a newspaper and the biggest advertisers were the car dealers in town. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they did, they really did try to put a lot of pressure on, on publishers. You know, some, some, somebody's kid was arrested for drunk driving, some, you know, that kind of thing, you know, and they'd call up and, you know, try to, try to twist arms, but, you know, so I, I think that that was pretty crude direct pressure and it was resisted. And, you know, the shell oils of the world and the Dow chemicals of the world, you know, I'm frankly glad that they are taking out ads um, because we've got to go report those stories. And I don't think that uh, nobody I know anyway at major media companies felt like they couldn't do that reporting because of where those ad dollars came from. Yeah, my impression having worked at four newspapers is, is probably similar. I, I do think, you know, Aaron's concern about the role of a vested interest in, in, in solving the problem. I mean, that is one that um, we're, we're all pretty well aware of I, the impact on, on, journalism directly might might be less acute and sometimes it's 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 uh you know I, i've been thinking about again going back to the ukraine situation and the sequencing of events here where you had um you know the big conference in, in scotland late last year and it seemed like there was some momentum around prioritizing this issue and then you know disappointing humans get in the way and you have this you know war in Europe that feels like we're back in World War II era. And um, it, it's related not just in terms of, um, you know, perhaps reshuffling the priorities and public attention, but also suddenly, you know, we see that the U.S. government is having to adjust its uh, policies um, 
uh, in terms of uh, our energy futures, at least in the sh short term, um, given the the shocks to the you know supplies coming out of Russia and what that means for Western Europe and its dependency on on fossil fuels, um, which is not an insignificant um, matter, um, you know, to make it through the winter and and but it does kind of becomes the latest excuse to perhaps, you know, uh, take the, you know, um, kind of slow down the sense of, of urgency, which already had obviously plenty of political headwinds, um, but that's just the, the latest thing. So I, I do, um, you know, I don't wanna minimize Aaron's concern. And then also it's, it's, I'm mindful that, you know, when we're looking at, the context in a, in a country like like Mexico, where you still have where you have a a government that is kind of doubling down on on its reliance on a on a state owned um, uh, oil company um, for political and and economic reasons. Um, you know that the, some of the concerns, even in terms of the interaction with with media, might might be uh, more significant than than in the U.S. Um, you know, I don't I don't want to dismiss the concerns, but what you know, what I think I, I do think, though, that there's uh, uh, probably a conspiratorial sense about some of this that is unwarranted. At the same time, yeah. I do think that the best way to combat it is to be really transparent about, OK, so where where does the money come from? Right. Who are your advertisers? Who are your partners and making sure you know, if you've got sponsored content that it's super clearly labeled, making sure people understand, um, you know, how, what, what funding is being made available and people can make up, people can make up their own minds. But I would just, just say that uh, I've, I've been relatively happy in most of my career about the lack of pressure uh, to do something one way or another. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm old enough to remember the um, the New York Times used to have a it was like a spot reserved. I think it was for some years, it was almost every day or once a week. A mobile oil would have a placement on the opinion pages where they would have like a messaging. I mean, as you said, sponsored mm -hmm. content and it was an ad, but it was like a mini editorial often competing with the newspapers editorials. Um, and it used to drive people crazy, but, um, it was, it was, you know, in a, in a country where you have free speech, um, it, it was, and it was clearly labeled as this message is brought to you by mobile. And it brought in a lot of resources for the newspaper to go out and, and do its independent, um, journalism. So, so, you know, sometimes, uh, it, it is, you're, you're asking a lot of the readers to kind of understand what's happening, but I, I do think there's a way, a way to do it. Um, Aaron did have a follow-up uh, or a second question that's that's kind of interesting in terms of how journalists should cover civil disobedience around climate change um, and the activism that targets fossil fuel industry, you know, direct actions. I think I think in some European soccer matches recently, they've they've had people, you know, uh, flood the field and tie themselves to the goalpost, interrupt matches with messaging around. Um, climate change. Clearly, we're seeing a lot of creativity in terms of civil disobedience and, and mobilization. Um, and that I think that does create interesting questions for, for journalists and, and objectivity and, and how, you know, much we should advance um, and lead with, with the motivation of these, uh, of this type of civil disobedience. Do you have, do you have thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I, I'm not so sure. Is it any different from covering other kinds of civil disobedience? Is it different from covering protests against a war? Is it different from, you know, other environmental protests over over the years that we have, we have seen? You know, people strapping themselves to trees and you know doing all kinds of all kinds of things. Um, you look, I I think we we cover events because they're newsworthy and it matters and these are stories that people should know and and in fact when when you cover civil disobedience the most important part of covering the civil disobedience is why people felt so strongly as to take the take the right. action right and making and and having people understand that but you know i i don't know why you wouldn't cover it if it if it was newsworthy and happening um 
I don't see why why you wouldn't. Right. But again, it's it's not that different from other types. No, I don't think of so. Civil disobedience. Um, so w- at the outset, you mentioned a couple of, of examples of, of things that you feel are perhaps mistakes and how we're, we, you know, we collectively as journalists cover um, this existential threat of this of climate, the climate crisis. But um, are there other mistakes that um, you would advise young journalists listening to to avoid, or, or things that people should should look out for, and maybe on the positive side. Um, well, you know, I'll tell you a big mistake we made in National Geographic, frankly, um, and it was about I don't know, maybe about five years ago. One of our photographers, an Arctic photographer named uh, Paul Nicklin, took an incredibly powerful picture of a star of a polar bear, a, like a starving polar bear. He was like, this poor polar bear was skin and bones, and I mean, obviously was in was in great distress. And uh, we used that picture to illustrate a story about how climate change was hurting polar bears. Well, that, I mean, while that is true in the macro sense, and we all know that that is, that is true, right? The ice melts, they can't, you know, they can drown. They, they, they need a ice, they need a perch, right? They need to be able to get onto the ice um, or onto the land. Um, we have no, we had no idea whether that particular polar bear, right? Who illustrated that story Maybe the bear was old. Maybe the bear was wounded. Maybe that bear was, had cancer. I mean, who the heck knows why that bear was in such terrible shape? And yet this bear became kind of the poster bear of climate change. And really, we had no idea. So we had no idea that the state of the bear was linked to climate change whatsoever. And so, you know, and... Hmm. and it was it was such an obvious error, and I, you know, we all felt stupid and terrible, and we had to apologize to readers, and it was a big mess. But and it was a, a mistake we never should have made, but it's an easy mistake to make. And so I would say for journalists of any age, you know, not to link things that are not necessarily linked, right? Because then people who decide that they don't like coverage of the climate crisis or doubt that this is happening will use it as a club against you, right? And so you don't want to make those kinds of mistakes. Um, You want to be really careful, uh, of course, in every story, but I think particularly in stories where there's uh, some, they're a little bit politically fraught or people who are on the other side of the issue, if there is another side of this issue, will will use errors to try to point, try to say this isn't really happening. Um, so I, I think it's super important that you be very careful about the conclusions that you draw and not overplay your hand in any of these stories. That's that's really good advice. <clears throat> if somebody can question your integrity on a small thing, then it opens the door to questioning the, the underlying uh, uh, the broader piece or subject or and all your other work. So that's really good advice. Um, any other advice for, for young journalists who might be listening, who maybe are getting started and, you know, covering um, local crime stories or uh, social events, but really want to gravitate towards, you know, tackling this, this, this climate story. Um, well, what, what yeah, advice do you have? I would, I would say a couple of things, which is, you know, learn a little something about it, right? So if people feed you a line of BS, you'll you'll know, hey, there's some, mm-hmm. you might not know exactly what's wrong, but you'll know, hmm, this doesn't really sound quite right. I need to check this out. I need to really investigate this further. So I, I do really think understanding some of the science uh, behind what's going on and just the facts of what is going on is really important and keeping up with it, right? Mm-hmm. Really understanding that, you know, only 20% of the, now, electricity in the United States, it's not even 20%. I think it's 19 point something percent of the electricity in the United States comes from renewables, right? Mm. It's good to just know stuff like that right. because people throw around all kinds of ridiculous figures and you've got to at least have a sense of whether they're 
they're they're right or whether whether they're wrong. And just something I touched on very briefly before, but I think matters in this story more than all, as much as anything. The whole sense of showing and not just telling. Nobody wants a science lecture, right? But the power of graphics and interactive graphics, right? Mobile, you know, uh, uh, digital graphics um, and photography in this particular story are are incredibly important. They they can visuals can really make your point. Uh, of visuals, whether they're illustration or graphic or photograph, better than almost anything. And so this is one of those cases where making sure you're not just telling the story textually, but in, in all of those other ways is so important because it's very, um, it, there are indelible images around climate change. And I think that that's what touches not just people's heads, but touches their hearts. And this is a story where you've got to touch people's hearts. Yeah, and, and on that front, we might be, there's, I'm kind of hardened by how um, nimble and, and, and adept and, and really good younger journalists tend to be at, at the multimedia aspect of the job and understanding the, the power of, of images. Um, I wanted to uh, make sure that, um, oh, and also the, what you said about, you know, just learning some of the subject matter um, is, is it, it's commonsensical, but I think sometimes what pe people starting off in journalism don't quite understand at times is that there's a, you don't have to be an expert you know, you don't have to be at the, your expertise doesn't have to be at the level of a scientist or the people that you're gonna use as sources and learn learn from and cite in articles. You don't, learning a subject doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna to get to that degree of knowledge and expertise because that's not realistic, but, but there's still a huge value to becoming somewhat like literate in a subject. And it can be a vast, there's a vast gap between those two, levels, but getting from zero to, like you said, just being able to have, a, to be able to discern when somebody's telling you something that doesn't quite add up. Um, you know, as an opinion journalist, I cover, I had to, I was sort of thrown into writing uh, and editing a lot on economic issues, and I certainly was no economist, but, you know, kind of became a, a, a quick study and, and, and developed some literacy in the subject that I was still far from being an, an expert like the ones we were publishing or that I was citing, but you know, there's there's just there's a, a little bit goes a, a long way. Um, I sometimes feel that way about our our journalism students when it comes to history as well. That a little bit goes a long way. So I think that's that's really good advice. Well, and knowing what you don't know, right? Knowing right. where you really need to know more about here. I gotta ask somebody, or you know, I just I'm right. just not confident here. So and yeah, knowing who to I'm ask is part of getting up to speed, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't want to let you go without posing a, a very tough question that comes from uh, our, our fearless leader at Convergence Lab and, and Symbiosis, Mia Armstrong, who, um, um, and, and thank you, Mia, for helping put all of this together. But Mia fed me a, a question that I thought was, was really good um, for you and really tough. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm giving her the credit. So you don't blame me for putting you on the spot here. But she says, in March of 2020, National Geographic published a creative edition. On one side of the magazine, a photo of a blue-green earth with the headline, How We Save the World. On the other, a reddish-brown photo headlined, How We Lost the Planet. So I'm assuming- ah, There we go. Ah, yes, thank you. So yeah, I'm assuming this is this was your doing, right? Um, oh, but yes. The magazine can, so this, these two divergent visions of our climate future, one optimistic, and one more pessimistic that suggests that it's too late, whereas the optimistic one suggests that there's some irre irreversible damage, but there's still hope. So, you know, putting you on the hot seat here, which vision do you buy into? And is one more important to represent than the other? Well, you know, so this was a, this was a version of the magazine. So if you read it, you know, so you see there, you've got how we save the world um, right side up. So if you read it in that direction, half of the magazine were stories about 
you know, people getting in, you know, young people taking action against climate change, all of the great technology uh, solutions underway, some of the some of the things that were going on that were positive efforts. But if you turned the magazine over, right, and you read it going in the other direction, it was in fact about people, you know, ignoring UN reports, nothing, you know, people, all of these, you know, governments dithering and not really doing anything. And it, and it went on like that. I thought we did this for Earth Day 2020. Um, now I thought I was really, really proud of this particular issue of National Geographic, which got exactly no publicity. Because if you will remember okay. March, what happened in March of 2020, <laughs> right? So the uh, you were oh. talking about climate issues always being overshadowed. Well, there you go. This was seriously yeah. overshadowed by the pandemic. But I thought this was an award-winning issue that nobody read. Um, uh, but look, I do think it's important to try to figure out to try every gimmick in the book, right? To, to figure out how do you engage people in the conversation? And I thought this was a way to do that. And I believe had it not been for, for, the, for the pandemic and everybody going home literally as the issue was, was uh, coming out on the newsstand and, uh, and, and in uh, people's uh, digital mailboxes uh, that it would have actually in, in sparked a really good conversation. So that's, that is why we did it that way. Uh, was to try to spark the conversation. Yeah, no, it, it was it's brilliant. And so I, I I was looking at the headlines. It's it's looking back from 2070, right? Which is a great, right? A great um, so which half did you find more persuasive? Well, you know, the verdict's in still some, out. In some, well. You know, I don't know. I really liked stories on both sides of it, of it. Let me put it that way. Right. So it was right. the, yeah, this was the, it was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And we were looking ahead to what would be said at the hundredth anniversary of Earth Day 2070. Um, um, so uh, I, I liked stories on, on both sides of it. I loved the story on the, on the good side. Uh, on the we've saved the world side about all of the young people doing amazing things. And we did find so many people around the world doing incredible things. And then on the, on the bad side though, I, I thought some of the stories about what was going on in Louisiana, frankly, um, just with the, with the land being just eaten up, you know, a football field the day of, of land, just kind of getting lost to the salt marshes and the salt water encroaching was pretty darn compelling. So I think both of those things are important to know. And, and that's that balance, that, that elusive balance that we really struggle for. Yeah. Well, Susan, um, time has flown by. And um, so I, I wanna be respectful of your time and our audience's time. Um, thank you so much for doing this with us. We're really fortunate at ASU that you have joined us recently and really look forward to collaborating with you and, and to see, you know, some of the innovative ways in which you're going to bring together our, our journalism faculty and students and, and our scientists within the university and, and hopefully create models of collaboration for, for the rest of industry and, and other universities. Um, so, so really want to thank you for, for your time today. Um, thank you. And this, and, and also thanks to all of you who, who listened in. This is, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, part of our Symbiosis, uh, collaboration between the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and Gato Pardo. Um, Gato Pardo has been a fantastic partner. I say that sitting on the ASU side of things. Um, Symbiosis is a, a journalism trade craft developing program. Um, we've been doing a lot of public chats like this one, interactive workshops, and, and we're also going to be doing on site journalism residencies. Um, in fact, applications are currently open for the residency program hosted by Gato Pardo, which will be held in Yucatan um, this summer, and, and folks from, from Arizona State University will also be involved in that, as we have been with these chats and the workshops. Um, so look for more coming from uh, Symbiosis, and if you're interested in, in learning more about our um, residency in the Yucatan Peninsula this summer, um, you can find more information at academiagatopardo.com slash symbiosis. 
and I think we were sharing a, a link here as well. Um, the application is uh, literally due this week. I think there'll be a, a couple of days grace period, uh, kind of like in the US, our taxes are due tomorrow, but I think we have till Monday. Um, given when you're listening to this, um, early next week should be should be fine. Uh, but really, thank you to Susan and thank you to all of you who've, who have dialed in to, to listen today. And um, this is obviously a huge subject that we're gonna continue um, working on um, in our all our respective places. And so until next time, take care. Muchas gracias y nos vemos pronto. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. <laughs>